Welcome to this edition of Sports Medicine Concepts Informative Friday Series. My name is Mike Sindoma and I'm the Program Director at Sports Medicine Concepts and the host of the Informative Friday Series. Recent trends in pre-hospital care protocols find more and more EMS providers moving away from using traditional spine boards to transfer and immobilize a potentially spine-injured patient, including equipment-laden athletes. Many EMS protocol updates call for use of a cervical collar and aiding the injured patient to a gurney where they are immobilized for transport. Other EMS protocols call for use of a scoop stretcher to transfer an injured patient to a gurney where they are then immobilized for transport. This topic of EMS transfer and immobilization protocol changes hit home for me this fall when my EMS agency said they had switched from long spine boarding to a scoop stretcher protocol. I know many of you had the same experience or are going to have the same experience in the future, so I'm sure many of you have the same questions that I do. Here are some of the questions I had at the outset. Would the person stabilizing the head and neck be in the way when assembling the scoop stretcher? Would the scoop stretcher blades get stuck on the equipment, grass, or turf? Should we immobilize in the scoop prior to transfer to a gurney? Should we leave the athlete immobilized in the scoop or do we remove the scoop once on the gurney? Would equipment removal be harder from a gurney than from on the field or from a spine board? And finally, would the scoop stretcher promote significantly safer handling of an equipment laden athlete throughout the entire continuum of care? To get some real life answers to these questions, I thought it would be valuable to dedicate an informative Friday segment to taking a very pragmatic look at the appropriateness of using a scoop stretcher to transfer an equipment-laden athlete. To do so, I arranged for a field trip to the Monroe County Public Training Facility in Rochester, New York. This is a fascinating facility where preparation and training for all kinds of emergencies takes place. This facility hosts a war room for coordination and management of all kinds of large-scale emergencies and provides the latest police, fire, and tactical response training resources available. They even have a mock airplane fuselage in the back, and because we're so close to the airport, they oftentimes will let pilots know training is underway so airline passengers don't become alarmed when flying overhead. Peter Bonadonna, the director of Monroe County Community College Paramedic Program, is also SMC's EMS liaison. As SMC's EMS liaison, Peter helps ensure that the In Two Minutes or Less Sports Emergency Care Training Program exceeds best practice pre-hospital care standards. Peter had to teach a paramedic class during our visit, but he graciously allowed us to make use of the training facility and some of his paramedic students to review scoop stretcher protocol. But enough of the pleasantries, let's get started. Regardless of the protocol used to transfer an injured athlete, the athlete will first need to be repositioned to supine. I've really become a fan of the log roll push maneuver, particularly with equipment laden athletes. It seems to provide a much more controlled log roll than the traditional technique. The log roll push does require at least four people to complete the maneuver, so you'll have to account for this in your emergency action plan. Once the athlete is supine, we can employ any one of a number of transfer techniques. Of course, today we'll be using a scoop stretcher. There are two types of scoop stretchers that are likely to be carried on your ambulance rig. The traditional aluminum version is the most common, probably because they are the least expensive option, but you are also likely to see the more expensive plastic models. Before we even got started, we uncovered an interesting trend that must be addressed with respect to scoop stretchers, maintenance. Unlike a traditional spine board, the scoop stretcher relies on moving mechanical parts that must be properly maintained to ensure proper function. It might be appropriate to add this to your medical timeout checklist. We contacted Ferno to inquire as to recommended ways to maintain the mechanical components of their scoop stretchers. They referred us to the user's manual, which suggests a regular maintenance schedule that includes disinfecting after each use, cleaning waxing as needed, a monthly inspection, and lubricating the hinges, lock pins, and coupling halves as needed. Lubricate the side surfaces and end couplings with white lithium grease. Apply a small amount of SAE 30 weight motor oil to lock pin lever hinges and foot section hinges and use a general purpose dry coating Teflon lubricant on all lubrication points. Okay, now, the first question I wanted to look into was would the individual positioned at the head and neck be in the way during application of the scoop stretcher? This was clearly not the case at all as we applied the scoop stretcher. However, maintaining a mobilization and cervical neutral position during application of the scoop stretcher seemed to be an issue as we progressed. A question that many have had about the scoop stretcher is, would the blades of the scoop get caught on the equipment? 
I've asked EMS providers about this, and many felt that a little subtle rocking back and forth would suffice in getting the scoop stretcher under the equipment-laden athlete. Our subject came in at 6'3", 290 pounds, and as you can see, we struggled to get the scoop stretcher in position. Even though we don't know how much movement is too much movement, this process was obviously more challenging and produced much more movement than we are used to seeing during a traditional spineboarding protocol. This was caused by the scoop stretcher getting caught on the back of the equipment and by the weight of the subject driving the blades of the scoop into the turf. That seemed to answer the second question I was curious about. Would the scoop get stuck on the equipment or the turf? Apparently the most common aluminum style scoop stretchers will, particularly with a larger, heavier athlete. Medical teams will also want to consider the weight limits of the traditional aluminum scoop stretcher. The traditional aluminum scoop stretcher is the most common type of scoop stretchers carried by EMS. However, they are only rated for up to 350 pounds. And as you can see, the scoop stretcher was barely wide enough for our subject. Therefore, the common aluminum scoop stretcher is likely not going to cut it for many athletic programs. Plastic scoop stretchers can have a load capacity up to 500 pounds, but not all plastic scoop stretchers are rated for heavier loads. In this transfer segment, you can see that our 290 pound subject stressed our plastic scoop stretcher, suggesting that it is most likely a model rated for 350 pounds. It looks very similar to this model, which is rated for 500 pounds. Therefore, medical teams using a scoop stretcher transfer protocol will need to ensure they have a scoop stretcher that will fit an oversized equipment-laden athlete and that it is rated to handle heavier subjects. Although the plastic-style scoop stretchers can cost twice as much or more, cost does not necessarily indicate the load capacity, and I'm not sure we saw a significant difference in ease of application or improvement in overall protocol efficiency when using a plastic versus aluminum scoop stretcher under our conditions. We went back and retried the aluminum scoop stretcher using the V application technique described in the instruction manual, but our results were similar. In both cases, we are unable to get the top of the scoop to latch without what appears to be a significant amount of movement relative to what we are used to seeing during traditional spineboarding protocols. Next, we retried the traditional and V application techniques using a plastic scoop stretcher to see if there was a perceived or observational difference relative to the traditional aluminum model. Here you can see that we had similar problems, including trouble working the mechanisms and an inability to efficiently position the scoop under the athlete without what appears to be significant movement. The next question I wanted to specifically address was do we immobilize the athlete in the scoop stretcher prior to transfer to the gurney? When asking if we should immobilize the athlete's head and neck while on the scoop stretcher, but prior to transfer, we got mixed responses. Some said no, because the immobilization devices would have to be removed once on the gurney in order to remove the scoop stretcher before securing the athlete to the gurney. Others said they would immobilize prior to transfer to the gurney because they would transport the athlete on the gurney without removing the scoop stretcher. So there appears to be some protocol variations that scoop stretcher users will want to address during annual review. We purposely did not provide any feedback with respect to how to immobilize our subject's head and neck because we wanted to replicate what might be expected from standard BLS service. Here you can see that we can do much better than using white tape. Medical teams implementing a scoop stretcher protocol should be sure to provide proper head immobilization devices such as foam head blocks and a pro strap. This leads us to yet another question. Once the athlete is transferred to the gurney, do we remove the scoop stretcher? Here again, there seems to be some variation in protocols. When an athlete is transferred in full protective equipment, it seems more appropriate to remove the scoop stretcher after transfer to a gurney is complete because the scoop stretcher would certainly complicate equipment removal at any point along the continuum of care. Some will argue that the challenges we face during completion of the traditional and V-scoop stretcher techniques is evidence in support of on-field equipment removal prior to the scoop stretcher transfer. This may very well be an appropriate safe handling consideration under certain conditions. Medical teams electing to implement a scoop stretcher protocol will want to ensure they practice these techniques and discuss conditions that may warrant equipment removal prior to transfer via scoop stretcher protocol. This leads us to yet another question. Is it harder to remove equipment from an athlete who is immobilized directly to a gurney than from an athlete who is immobilized on a traditional spine board? And if so, how does this influence our feelings towards the scoop stretcher transfer protocol? 
We tried equipment removal from a gurney using the traditional flat torso and torso lift techniques. We then tried both these techniques in the back of an ambulance simulator. We don't believe that either removal technique will be significantly more difficult for medical professionals well practiced in these equipment removal techniques. Removal in the ambulance simulator was not particularly challenging either. However, the trend in ambulance design might not provide all the room we had in this particular simulator. Therefore, medical teams will want to review in ambulance equipment removal as part of their annual EAP rehearsal to make sure the ambulance and all equipment is appropriate for management of an oversized equipment laden athlete. Okay, so here's the deal. We're not going to find a one size fits all approach. Medical professionals want to evaluate each and every scenario individually to decide on the safest handling measures. That being said, this informational Friday segment seemed to reveal some real concerns with respect to generalizing general pre-hospital care scoop stretcher protocols to the athletic environment. To further explore these issues, we pose these concerns to an expert panel during this month's white paper series. Be sure to check out this month's recording. It was a great discussion. This has been another segment of Sports Medicine Concepts Informative Friday series. A special thanks to the Monroe County Training Facility. Be sure to subscribe and leave your feedback in the comments section below, and we'll see you in the next video.